April 9th, Norway invaded. The battle of the continent becomes Europe's total war. One month later, Holland falls. Beloved Queen Wilhelmina seeks refuge abroad. Millions of Belgians reenact the tragic migration of 1914. May 28th, Leopold, king of the Belgians, surrenders and the world despairs. Dunkirk, here 300,000 allied soldiers battle and swim to safety under an infernal fire. June 5th, the critical battle of France begins. For three terrifying weeks, the armies of Dagon fall back in the face of overwhelming mechanized might. Italy, while France fights for its life, Italy marches beside Germany. Six weeks after Holland and Belgium were crushed, tragic history is enacted at Campania. The image of General Foch watches as another conqueror arrives. He boards the same railroad car where Foch himself gave the armistice terms to the defeated Germany of 1918. These Nazi officials come with different emotions than those other Germans 22 years before. This time, French plenipotentiaries, seeking terms instead of giving them, arrive to learn the fate of their republic. Grim formality when victor and vanquished meet. With terms stated, Adolf Hitler allows time for the French to telephone the Vichy government. Solemnly, silently, the French delegates follow for a conference with the man who became Premier of France only six days before. Henri Patin, who must give the answer. Weighted hearts return to the historic car, bearing their fateful message. France has decided. The knee is bowed in submission with a flourish of tragic pen. War spreads eastward, Britain's fleet fights the road of Berber and Somaliland. Digging out proceeds. Even the dummies get attention. 
We mean gummy. Buckingham Palace, still not escape the Nazi reign of steel. King George and Queen Elizabeth examine a piece of the missile that demolished the park of their palace home. St. Paul's Cathedral, where royalty and commoner worship, also suffered. A bomb pierces the roof, destroys an altar, but spares other treasured monuments. The heroic RAF takes an ever-increasing toll. Nazi planes have fallen on English soil by the thousands. May well be that the final extinction of a baleful domination will pave the way to a broader solidarity of all the men in all the land than we could ever have planned if we had not marched together through the fire. Aid to Britain short of war. In exchange for Atlantic naval bases in English possessions, 50 discarded World War destroyers are reconditioned. At a Canadian port, Americans transfer the sorely needed war craft. Millions for artillery. Millions for tanks and anti-tank guns. Millions for airplanes, thousands of them, while American flats are turning out other thousands for Britain. American Army airmen were the first to experiment with parachutes for war, years before Russia and Germany made use of them in actual conflict. As Japan casts its lot with the Axis powers, the United States seeds the building of its first two ocean navies. of the pen, President Roosevelt sets in motion the nation's machinery for drafting all men between the ages of 21 and 35. October 16th. On this day, millions of American youth in every corner of the nation register for military service. History repeats itself. A World War drama is reenacted. The same fishbowl from which capsules were drawn for the wartime draft of 1917 again serves for the country's first peacetime call. America throbs to the beat of the most startling presidential campaign in many decades. Wendell Wilkie arouses amazing devotion and respect in his strenuous bid for the White House. President Roosevelt also is given thunderous reception. For the first time in history, a president of the United States is re-elected for a third term. Mm -hmm.